Welcome everyone. It's great to have kids and kids at heart here this, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're at. Um, I'm here to share with you STEM E stories um, and costumes from space or actually costumes that astronauts wear. So at this point, I'm gonna share my screen and share uh, the adventures that we had while we were in space going up here. All right. Well, first of all, I just wanted to remind you that this really is for kids at Kids at Heart. And this is my little sister and I when I'm probably about in kindergarten. And I grew up in Colorado. And just like this year, there was snow on the ground when we were supposed to be going trick-or-treating. So uh, as you can see, we made some of our own costumes. Oftentimes our costumes were covered with jackets and we didn't get very far while we were trying to collect candy. But I hope that uh, you follow along here and it reminds you that when you grow up, you will get to wear many costumes. And some in fact are space vehicles, but probably three or four years after this picture was taken, I created this paper mache astronaut because I started dreaming about becoming an astronaut when I grew up. And as you know, I did get selected to become an astronaut. And so I thought I'd start with our training because right away astronauts arrive in Houston and they've been in their normal street gear, whether they were teachers like myself or fighter pilots, doctors, scientists, you name it, the STEM backgrounds that they came from. When we arrive, we've either been in the military or civilians, and suddenly we are now all astronauts. And so we put on some of our first costumes and the blue suit is the one that people recognize immediately. This is our flight suit. We wear this in the T-38 that we fly in across the country to do some of our practice training. So this was my class, a class of 14 astronauts, uh, three from the Japanese Space Agency and the other 11 American astronauts. Right away, we went to Maine to do our survival training and we were on a Navy, naval base, so we wore the fatigues of the field and they were very useful because um, as you can see here, we were doing a simulation of what it might be like if you were in some sort of aircraft and it crashed and you had to triangulate and get to a place 
and you had to work with maybe a crewmate or someone that had gotten injured. So that is why we're dressed the way we're dressed. And we spent three days in the wilderness learning how to use different skills and work as a team and then also put our skills to use. And astronauts do that all the time. They simulate many times things that thankfully don't really happen, but it helps train them to think and work as a team and problem solve. Well, next we went to Pensacola, another naval base. And here you can see we wore not our blue flight suits on this particular day. We wore some older green flight suits um, because we were going to be wet the whole entire day. And I often joke that this is my least favorite day of training, but that's just because we were wet and drug under the water and flipped under the water in, in helicopter bodies. And there was a lot of simulation. And by the end, uh, you felt like you were just drowning. So one of my least favorite days of training, but still a pretty awesome day of training. Well, then back into the blue flight suit. And now I was really excited because we were actually getting to be in the prop plane. This is the T-34. It's a slower plane, a great way to start for those of us that had not been in a, a plane before as a pilot in command. And even though I would never be the pilot in command, I got the opportunity in this particular plane to sit up front and see what the pilots see and then do um, the touch and goes and learn about how to fly the plane. Eventually I moved to the back seat where again, I can still use the stick, fly the plane, do the communication and the navigation. But this way I can be learning from the pilot that's in front of me. So first flying in our flight suits. Well, then this is the T-38 jet, and this is a plane that astronauts can get in about once a week, sometimes more often, especially when you're assigned to your flight and you need to be going from Houston, where most of us live, to Florida or to California for different tra training events in our vehicles. So the T-38 is a great way to train because it's an aircraft, and again, when you fly in space, you're going to be flying in an aerospace vehicle, and so it has systems, some of them very similar to the ones that you would operate in a spacecraft, and it, and it helps you think in a real-time environment, how to think through things like fuel, which is always critical in a T-38, the weather, takeoff conditions, landing conditions, if you have a failure, um, just even normal conditions. So I really enjoyed flying in the T-38. Finally, we were ready to start training in the shuttle. Now these are simulators. And as you can see in a simulator, you can just wear your normal clothes. You don't need anything special. That's because it's like a classroom, only it's a classroom that has the same switches and circuit breakers that are found in the actual space shuttle. So it's a great way to practice and learn. And believe me, I spent many hours um, on my Saturdays sitting where the commander and pilot sit and just practicing over and over so I could learn these systems and understand how they work together. Then eventually we move out of the uh, single system trainer and into a motion based trainer. And in this case, we work with three other astronauts and we move around. We actually sit in the seats of where the commander and pilot would sit. And then those of us that were mission specialists where we would sit, we move around so that we understand how every single seat is critical to the space flight. So it's great training. And, uh, but still we could wear our street clothes in those, in those training events. Some days we work in the mock-ups and some days when we're in the mock-up, we can be in our street clothes, but other days we actually get to finally put on the orange suit. And we lovingly call this suit the pumpkin suit, which seems so appropriate for this time of year. And then we also train in virtual simulators. So here I'm learning how to do the robotic arm training. Um, and sometimes we even go to Canada to learn on the space station robotic arm and do specialized training there. So that eventually we'll be ready to operate arms in space. And then some of my favorite training is spacewalk training. And this is a very special suit, even though it looks like the suit that the astronauts wear for actual spacewalks in space, of course, we're getting into the water. So if you look a little bit more closely, especially on this right picture, you'll notice that the back 
pliss here. This is the, the life protection suit that um, is in space. You'll notice it's actually made of plastic and that it, some of it has holes in it. That's because you're in water. You don't want the suit to make you sink and stick stick you to the bottom of the floor of the big swimming pool, which is 40 feet deep. No, you want to be able to move up and down in the water column, just like an astronaut can move up and down and across the space vehicle in space. So um, that is how we do it. It looks a lot, it operates a lot like the suit in space, but of course, because you're in the water, it's designed not to <laughs> make you sink at the bottom. And in the picture on the left, that is my daughter, just as, as she's about five months old. So that was when I was starting my spacewalk training. Now she's a 13 year old, but over the years, she's had a lot of fun watching me change costumes. Well, finally, astronauts actually get dressed up and we graduate. So you can see we put on our spiffy suits and outfits, and this is our graduation at um, Space Center Houston, which is right across from Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. So uh, a great event. Usually it takes about a year and a half to two years for astronauts to do all of their training. Some of what we looked at, some of it is also language and other types of training that I didn't show pictures of. But finally, you reach this day and it's a proud moment um, that you get to share with your family and friends, those people that have helped you reach this point. Now you're very excited to get ready and actually be assigned suits for space. So like I said, the orange suit, we lovingly call the pumpkin suit. But this suit is really important. It was, um, it was started its use after we lost the crew challenger. And we realized that we wanted to have a suit that would protect astronauts on ascent and entry. So this orange suit, if you look at it, it actually has umbilicals that oxygen will um, plug into and also a cooling port with water that will um, allow you to, to stay cool or warm, uh, but usually it's cool when you're in Florida launching uh, the, through your long underwear. If you look this blue long underwear that you wear under the orange suit, it actually has little tiny tubes where that water flows through. And so it can help you either stay warm when we're returning back to earth because we actually get the vehicle so cold that you are cold with the vehicle. And so you're glad you have that warm water. But when you're sitting in the waiting for launch, in Houston or in Texas, not in Texas, sorry, in Florida on the launch pad, you're thinking, oh my goodness, it's so warm. And that suit really helps keep you cool too. And then you see that it has the protective um, helmet and that helmet seals. And then we do comm checks right as we're getting ready to fly into space. So that's the orange pumpkin suit. It's really the ascent and entry suit. Well, here we're going to actually see it put into use. So there I am in the center. I was the flight engineer on our mission. Uh, we flew on Discovery, the fourth to last flight. We are excited. The main engines are just starting to light. So they light up, they gamble, and then if they come up to 100% thrust, which they did, then you saw those solid flights. Look at all that power. As that power is going through those solid rocket boosters and the, and the main engines, we were shaking and uh, you just really felt it. Well, eventually the solids will come off and they'll fall back to the ocean and be recovered. And we'll continue for another five minutes on the um, liquid hydrogen and oxygen in that orange tank. And it's about an eight minute and uh, 20 some second flight to go from Florida to be over Europe. It's in crazy intense and also just really beautiful. And so these are some of the photos that were taken after our launch, because um, it was very early in the morning. Well, when we finally docked to the space station and um, entered it, that was about three days later, we met up with my friend Tracy, who's in the 
maroon shirt. So in this case, we set a record, a record that wasn't even planned. It was four women in space because we were showing up and doing our job. And it just happened that, that our flight coincided with Tracy's time in orbit. Um, I show this like most of the time astronauts wear some sort of polo. Um, we have we get to choose some colors so you can see that the shuttle crew selected blue and in Tracy's case she had a maroon shirt with her patch and logo. And then we have um, either khaki pants or you'll see sometimes we wear blue pants with Velcro. There's several pairs of pants that we can choose from, um, but we don't just wear any clothes in space. Uh, it's very important that we select from a range that is safe. Um, we usually use cottons, anything that if there were, hopefully never, but if there were some flame in space, the clothing we've selected would burn slowly and we could get it put out is really the goal. So we try to keep everything very safe. And then that's why you'll see there's kind of a limited range of colors, but people get creative. So you can see those pants. They have special Velcro in all sorts of places. Um, very handy when you're a shuttle crew member and you've got all sorts of stuff that you don't know where to put it. You can just stick it to yourself. And here I like to always say that one of my costumes was being a fast food deliverer because these are food boxes and I am flying through the space station um, and the space station is moving at 17,500 miles per hour. So some fast food there. Well, now we'll talk about the actual spacewalk suit, um, the one that goes outside for real. And here, Clay and Rick are getting their suits ready the night before, making sure they have all the tools that's needed for one of three spacewalks that they did during our flight. And we keep these suits, um, they have interchangeable arms so that if you have a little bit longer arms, you know, we can adjust the rings and, and make it, or if you're, you have smaller arms, we can adjust it. Um, it's really neat how the suit has these different places where we can adjust and resize it. On the big day of the spacewalk, Clay and Rick get up early. Jim would get them into the suit, do the pressure checks, the calm checks, and then I would come along. My job was that I'd be talking to them the whole time they were outside. Um, I was their backup crew member, so I would I had gone through all these spacewalks in the water with them, and I knew everything that they would be doing. So Jim and I would make sure that they're all geared up and ready to put in that airlock. So let's just talk about these suits a little bit. You know, within them, they're at a pressure that is different than the space station's pressure. So they're going to be in a suit with just pure oxygen, but it's at a lower pressure. It's at 4.2 pounds per square inch versus the pressure inside the volume of the space station, which is at 14.7 pounds per square inch. So lower pressure, but pure oxygen. Now, of course, when they're working outside, they're going to be giving off a lot of carbon dioxide as they breathe. Well, we have a plan for that. In the back of these backpacks, there is a canister that as the air moves and there's a vent above their head and it forces fresh oxygen over their face and it gets rid of the CO2 bubble around their face. As that air moves, then it will take the CO2 out and um, move it through the backpack and through this cartridge so that there'll be fresh oxygen coming in and CO2 will not be harming the astronaut. So that's how we help with that. Also, once again, they're wearing long underwear with those tubes in it because space ranges in huge temperature swings from the bright sunlight that's over 240 some degrees to the cold of the shadows. And so it goes from really hot to really cold. And therefore, on the front of their suit, they can dial the temperature that they need and that will change how much warm or cold water is introduced into those hoses of their um, their long underwear suit. So that's another part of this. Now the suit itself has multiple layers too, and that is to protect them and also to keep the suit for like if anything ever like uh, tried to puncture it, it would stop. It's got a ripstop material that would stop that from happening. 
And then also, of course, in the backpack is the oxygen and um, the water tanks that I talked about that would help with the cooling. And then for them, so that they can have some water during this six to eight hours that they're working outside, they have a drink bag. Uh, it's a lot like a exercise bag with a camel pack bite valve. And so they can turn and use the bite valve. Um, so that is their spacesuit, and they'll be in it, like I said, for six to eight hours. It is what is protecting them and allowing them to operate outdoors. Well, right away when they leave the space station and they um, get ready to do their spacewalk, they connect this safety tether. So I always laugh that I think it's funny we call it a spacewalk. It made sense when we were on the moon, but when you're working on the space station, you're using your hands. So it's more like a space handstand, a hand over hand maneuver for hours at a time. And so the safety tether is what keeps them always attached. So of course they're holding on, they don't want to go floating off into space, but that safety tether makes sure that they will not. You can kind of think of it as a retractable dog leash, but a very, very sturdy one. It's only 85 feet long and the space station is much larger than that. So they carry spare safety tethers. And when you see also astronauts just by themselves on the robotic arm, they are safety tethered to that robotic arm. So that is how we operate is always with a tether. Our crew members also were inside working with Rick and Clay outside. So Stephanie and Jim helped work the robotic arm. And in this picture, you can, you can see Rick right here by this, uh, the space station's robotic arm, and you can see Clay. This is the ammonia tank that we were um, replacing. This is a brand new one we were going to be changing out with the old one. And the ammonia tank is used to cool equipment on the outside of the space station. But what you don't see are all the other crew members that are involved. So I talked about Stephanie and Jim, they're operating this Canadian arm. Of course, I'm talking to them and letting them know what Houston is saying, but also instructing them through all the things we've practiced, but just kind of in the back of their heads so they don't forget anything. And then the really big team, the team that we are so grateful for, but that is not pictured here, is of course our flight controllers and all of our instructors. So all of those people are available when things go wrong and things did go wrong, nothing really big, but we did have to alter one of our spacewalks by about four hours, which shifted everything that we had planned. And those folks on the ground were dedicated and sent up new procedures and we were able to execute them without any problems because of the great training from our trainers. So just a lot of teamwork involved. And there you get a zoom in shot. Well, I took this photo and it's the only time I've probably been on the front cover of a magazine. It was just the magazine local to the Johnson Space Center. But I love it because it reminds me of a couple of things. One, you can see the crescent moon um, above the space station. And I, I am an amateur astronomer, so I just love seeing that crescent moon. Two, um, this space station is incredible and it's been able to operate for 20 years with humans on board. And so the fact that we can live and work there and have done that continuously for 20 years is just incredible in itself. But you and I live on a spaceship too. Did you think about that? We live on this incredible spaceship Earth. And th this reminds me of how thin that atmosphere is and how much fragile um, habitat we have just for the humans and how little fresh water. And so my current job as a geologist is to make sure that we protect our spaceship Earth. Well, after a spacewalk, the, the team comes inside and here Tracy and Jim and I will help get Clay and Rick out of their suits and get them back into normal clothes like us where they can finally go eat and just relax because they've had a busy day. Speaking of eating, well, astronauts love to share food with their colleagues in space. It's just like here on Earth, it's great to share stories over dinner, to laugh, to have fun. And we don't 
know or train very often with our colleagues in Russia. Um, only those crew members that would be living on the, or the space station for long periods of time were, were able to train with those crew members. So for us as visitors on a shuttle, this was just a great opportunity to share stories about our families and our cultures. And speaking of culture, Naoko is in a unique space outfit. She specially flew um, this kimono so that she could share it with the Japanese people. This was a very special day, uh, well, a special docking. Um, there are two Japanese crew members in space, Soichi Noguchi and Naoko Yamazaki. And so just we enjoyed this whole evening having both a combination of uh, Japanese food, some sushi in space, as well as some uh, food provided by our Russian colleagues as well. Okay, now we're gonna to get to some fun costumes that people wear when they get creative in space. So last year on Orbit, we had a Where's Waldo, looks like we've got a pirate, uh, a very creative, you know, some fun glasses, and I'm not even sure who stowed away on board the space station. But as you know, astronauts spend their time, then they're in space um, all these, you know, year round. And so crews will come and go, and sometimes they may be on orbit during Halloween or they may not, but when people are, they like to show their spirit. And we've also had some fun experiments, so I thought that you would like this. Um, this is, of course, Skittles, and they're just in a bowl, but when people would pass by, they're, you know, they're floating or they're, they're they're staying wherever they are. It's kind of an inertia experiment, but it's neat because if someone bumps it, of course, then they'll bounce around and move around. So, you know, I don't think they were eating this candy like kids might be doing in the next few days, but they were just showing this as a demonstration that these Skittles are hanging out. Okay, well, there's lots of things to celebrate and lots of reasons to pull out decorations. Here, these crew members are celebrating Thanksgiving, and we do actually fly. You saw that in the previous slides that we flew um, sushi. We flew some special Japanese food to um, have sushi in space. Well, of course, Thanksgiving is a really important for American astronauts, but they also share this time with everyone on board. And so there's some some turkey and some stuffing, some green beans, probably some mashed potatoes, and folks are sharing how they celebrate Thanksgiving. And of course, our winter holidays on orbit. And these are some early crew members. So celebrating has not just been a thing of the present. It's been since the beginning of the space station. And can you imagine having your birthday in space? Well, Samantha is celebrating here. And just recently, Kate actually launched into space, Kate Rubens. Um, so what a way to celebrate your birthday. How exciting, so very different. I always thought it would be fun to say that you were getting to celebrate in every, you know, all across the world as you orbited. Um, so celebrating multiple times. But anyway, you can see that they got pretty creative to give her a little birthday dessert. And again, I want to remind you that this November, we're celebrating the International Space Station's birthday, 20 years of people continuously living in space. It's incredible. Some of you are too young to even remember the beginning of that, which means that there's always been people in space since you've been alive. Okay, well now I'm gonna to get to the STEM stories. Uh, it's just incredible to look out the window. On the left, we're getting a sunrise and those fleeting moments, they just last for moments because, um, because you are up so far above the earth, roughly 200 miles, 240 miles above the earth's surface. So the sunrises are not like here on earth. They are very quick and then you're in full daylight. Um, and they only last, daylight only lasts for 45 minutes and then you'll go into darkness for 45 minutes. So 16 sunrises and sunsets a day, that's pretty incredible as you go around the earth. Also, we get to see beautiful light shows like on the right where you're seeing the aurora and then stars behind. 
And we get chances to look at our beautiful Milky Way and to, to be reminded that we are just a small orbiting planet in this big, vast universe. Um, it really gives you some perspective as you're orbiting around. There's fun things and ways to um, experiment on orbit and people have played all sorts of instruments as you see here in all sorts of ways. So uh, we too, as astronauts like to play music and enjoy and you saw earlier when you if you joined early and saw the video you saw Naoko playing the kato. Um, there's been all sorts of instruments in space. We exercise in space. So here's another outfit, you know, um, pretty much normal shorts and t-shirts are the way that we can work out. But as you notice on Sunny, for in order for her to be on that treadmill, she's got to have the harness to hold her down. And, uh, but you can see this is the rare time is when we're actually exercising is when we wear shoes in space. Usually we're just wearing sock feet because you don't want to kick someone in the head with your shoes or, you know, mark up the wall. But of course, on a treadmill or you have clip in bike shoes for the um, ergometer that I'm wearing there or I'm using there. Or um, you can see that Dex is using his tennis shoes for the advanced resistive exercise device. Okay, now we love to play with liquids in space and sometimes it's very purposeful play and other times it's just because it's beautiful. It's so much different uh, than what we experience here on earth, even though it's the same property. You and I see the half bubble, like if we see dew on a plant or on the grass, but we don't see that perfect sphere. Um, so it's just beautiful to see that. Unlike flames on Earth, which have a teardrop shape caused by buoyant air rising in a gravitational field, flames in space curl themselves into tiny balls. Untethered by gravity, they flit around as if they have minds of their own. More than one astronaut conducting experiments for researchers on Earth below has been struck by the way flame balls roam their test chambers in a lifelike search for oxygen and fuel. Isn't that cool? So I think it's just, you know, that's actually a a very serious experiment with flame and it's contained and it's very safe, but it's to help us understand how combustion works in space, especially since vehicles use combustion with small engines and it helps move through the, um, helps us move in space. So understanding combustion, understanding fluids, these are all really important, whether we're doing it in play or doing it in a serious experiment. Speaking of serious experiments, the International Space Station has had thousands of experiments from researchers all across the globe. It's incredible the things that we can learn from, like I said, from the outer, outer space to our inner bodies. And so here we have Kate Rubin. She is the first person that was able to sequence genes in orbit. And now she's back up in orbit. And I know that's something she's excited to do again. And then you see other astronauts. Um, Steve Swanson is working with a fluid experiment. Again, trying to understand how things behave in a microgravity versus how we understand those things operating on Earth. Protein growth. Um, Serena Anand is using uh, this experiment to do some protein crystal growth. Crystals grow differently in space than they do on Earth. They're able to go in multiple directions instead of being contained in our gravitational field. So all of this has allowed us to make great discoveries, um, discoveries about our own body, the way we treat people, the way we um, understand how we could do potential cancer treatments, and it goes on and on. So I hope that in not only am I sharing with you these STEMI stories, but that I'm inspiring you to think about what type of science could you be doing in orbit? What could you be learning about the things around you on orbit? Because kids, to kids at heart, are constantly being able to fly things in space. And so here's a few more examples of some smaller chambers that have flown in space or just some fun things that people have done. Of course, Scott Kelly grew these flowers in the left upper hand corner. Um, that was just for fun because it's so interesting to see the things that we love on earth grow in a place that doesn't have a lot of plants. Then we do actually have veggie experiments and, we, and students of course is, have also directed some of these plant experiments. 
many different types of creatures have flown in containment in space. And so here are examples of spiders and butterflies, but there have been ants and fish and just numerous little creatures in space. If, you, if that piques your interest, go check them out, YouTube and the internet. Well, finally, it was time for us to come home. I was able to be docked to the space station for 11 days and in orbit for 15 days. So it was time to put back on that orange pumpkin suit, which is a lot harder to do in space than it is on Earth. But trust me, like cramming into it, getting things zipped up. Now, as we entered the Earth's atmosphere, you're seeing some flashes from our auxiliary power units, but also you're seeing that orange glow out the window. That is plasma. That means that we are going so fast and so hot that we are stripping electrons off of their um, of atoms. It's really incredible. You just heard two sonic booms. That's as we, of course, break the sound barrier, both with the nose and then in the back with our tail of the shuttle. And then the shuttle is a glider. So we are gliding into a runway. But these newer space vehicles are capsules. So they will either land on the ground or in the water. And you'll be seeing some of those uh, later this year. So here's our touchdown on the space shuttle. The chute goes out. That used to help um, reduce wear and tear and slow down the vehicle so that we could reuse the tires. And then the pilot will let the chute off and we'll come to a full stop. Well, after we uh, get a little bit of fluids in us and take a break, we put back on our blue flight suits and we are, are later that evening, I was able to be dancing with my three-year-old daughter and my family on the beach. So those are the mini costumes and um, the STEMI stories from space. And at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. So Alex wants to know who is our who is my favorite astronaut? Oh boy, that is a tough question. Um, but who inspired me? You know that little paper mache doll that I built. That is probably modeled off of. Uh, actually Catherine Sullivan. Um, I was inspired by Sally Wright, who was the first American woman to fly in space, but she did not do the spacewalk um, that on that flight. Catherine Sullivan did a spacewalk in 1984, which was right about that time I was making the paper mache doll too. So I was inspired by both of these women. I think that's probably who I modeled it af after. That first 1978 class of had women and minorities and all of them are an inspiration for persevering and being a part of such a great class that that paved the way for the rest of us as astronauts and izzy from kentucky did you want to go on a spacewalk and how many times did the astronauts on your mission go on a spacewalk? Yes, absolutely. I did want to go on a spacewalk and I had trained and worked hard to do so. But it just didn't work out that the type of work that needed to be done was actually better suited for um, Rick and Clay at the time. And so I was their backup and I enjoyed learning from them and working with them. And they did a total of three spacewalks on that mission. Are the visors on the spacesuits UV resistant? They protect us from the UV rays. So um, they will block out the UV rays, just like many of the windows on the International Space Station. So they are, there's two visors and they both are helping protect the astronauts' eyes because that would cause damage. The UV light would damage instantly their eyes. Uh, what was your favorite discovery in space? Oh, wow. My favorite discovery in space. There's so many great discoveries. I think some of the things that inspired me when I was younger um, uh, and that I, I thought about was actually what made me want to be an amateur astronomer. And that's like the discoveries that we were making about our own solar system. You know, Hubble flew in April of 1990. It was launched on the Space Shuttle Discovery, which I flew on the Space Shuttle Discovery. And Hubble sent back these incredible images that helped all of us change our thought about 
our solar system and our universe and what we thought of that. And so those, the ability to take up that, that telescope uh, really inspired me. And even before that, then our early probes out to planets, right? Like to get images of other planets that really starts making you think like, what's possible? Is there life out there? What does that life look like? Um, so, you know, going with my parents to the planetarium and just learning about what was coming back, it was so interesting to me. And Kyle and Lily say hello. And oh my goodness, Justin from Nemo 16 and Jonah, they hello to the family. So exciting to see people who I've worked with that have joined today. Thank you. Um, they want to know how did a swimsuit on your mission in Aquarius differ from your suit in space? <laughs> well, I did get a chance on Nemo 16. I lived underwater with five other crew members, and we got to actually wear a normal swimming suit, just like one that you would see at the beach. But then we put over it a long um, and thick, pretty thick neoprene suit. And that did help give us some neutral buoyancy in the water. What we were looking at in, in that underwater mission is if we were able to visit an asteroid with a human, what would we do at that asteroid? What type of geology and how would that work? Um, and how would we get samples? Now, as you heard last week, we did get a sample of an asteroid, but it was uh, collected by an, a craft uh, and it will be coming back and returning to earth and we'll get to learn so much more. Um, but someday, wouldn't it be really awesome to have a, an astronaut go to an asteroid? So that was what we were thinking about when we were on that mission. And that's how my suit differed. I did wear a helmet um, because, we uh, were diving in helmets and that was was pretty awesome it provided us air um and then we bubbled out uh you know you would see the bubbles coming out so hello it's so great to see you guys um okay another question let's see why and how did you get selected over all the other teachers that applied you know i don't know exactly why i was selected i um there were very talented teachers uh several thousand applied some of the important part that just selected down to the 35 of us that were interviewed um it, it you know it came down to a lot of medical things um the aptitude and then probably just the best fit, you know, and I, to, you know, it's probably good that I don't know why I was selected in some ways, um, made me work really hard during both the selection process. And then of course, during the training, but like I said, there's so many talented people, not just teachers that have applied during that class selection, but then also just people that have applied to be an astronaut and they're incredible and they do great things. And, uh, so some of it just comes down to the luck. Um, they also want to know if it is true that you can't have dental fillings to pass the physical. No, people do have fillings. Um, so um, that part, uh, you know, we've been able, you know, a lot of things have changed that didn't used to be possible and now are possible. Uh, it didn't, you used to have to have 20-20 um, vision, you know, now we can have LASIK surgery and become an astronaut. So as we've understood more about uh, what um, is and isn't a problem about the human body and how we can mitigate things and even just our medicine has become so much better then we've been able to allow astronauts uh, to have you know lots of different things that be to be able to be selected but still it does come down like those internal organs those things have to be really healthy because of course as we hope to get back to the moon. And as we live on the International Space Station, you just can't get medical uh, procedures done. And so it's really important to have healthy internal organs, which you have nothing to control. You know, you don't have any control over that. Okay, another question. Annie asks, I am 13 right now. What should I be doing right now to be, par to be prepared to be an astronaut? Well, Annie, one of the most important things that you can do, especially right now, um, whether you're at school or doing school from home, is to invest in your learning. 
astronauts are curious people. Astronauts have to solve all sorts of problems and be able to engineer things. So the most important thing you can be doing right now is learning, being curious all the time. Also, be physically active. Astronauts, like you saw, they're drawing through the water. They have to hike all over the place. They have to operate those big suits. Um, it's just incredible the type of physical activity that astronauts need to do. So be active, whatever sport you're interested in, or if you haven't started a sport, start thinking about some um, stay physically active, really important. And just be passionate about what you do. As you saw, astronauts have really interesting backgrounds. They play music, uh, all different types of music. You saw bagpipes, pianos, flutes, the kato. Um, we've even had people experiment with uh, the didgeridoo. Don Pettit did a fun vacuum tube didgeridoo in space. So being creative, being curious, those are really important parts of being an astronaut. Chantel wants to know, were you ever scared? You know, actually, the, the, the scariest times is when I think early on when you're training. Um, and it's because you don't always know what you're going to expect. Um, and, and then in space, I guess what, what I would say made me like not frightened type of scared, but to like be really diligent was that I know that spaceflight has a risk and that also I could make mistakes. Now, people will make mistakes in space. I made mistakes in space, but they were small mistakes, it's mistakes that you could capture, um, nothing that's going to harm your crewmates or your vehicle. And that's really important. And so uh, early on, I was concerned about that because, of course, I want everyone I fly with to be safe. And of course, I want all of us to get there safely and come home safely. So just diligently learning and working hard and learning how to trap mistakes so that you don't make a big one and the mistakes that you make can be caught quickly. And how many times did I go to space? I went to space the one time and it was really, really special to me. So, um, you know, some people have had multiple opportunities to fly to space and I chose to retire, not right away after I flew in space, but a couple years later, um, it was time for me to retire. So I had the one opportunity and I really, really loved it. Cedric asked, how many planets did you see besides Earth? Well, um, you're only 240 miles above the Earth. So the planets that you do see don't look much different than how you see them from Earth. But we were able to see Mars while we were in space. And I, I, I used to remember, but I think we were seeing Jupiter too. I can't remember if we were seeing Jupiter or Saturn. Um, so uh, we were able to see them. They just, you know, look more steady than they do down here because of course our atmosphere causes things to um, kind of flicker uh, and dance a little bit. The, the neat thing about, like you saw that picture of the Milky Way, um, the neat thing about being above the Earth's atmosphere is really seeing the colors of the stars and, um, and just really seeing so many stars because of not having the water vapor and not having light pollution just incredible. I mean, it almost was overwhelming because there's guidance stars that you and I are familiar with, like Ursa Major and Minor, or like we like to know it as the Big Dipper and as um, Polaris as part of the Little Bear. Um, but when you're in, in space, there's just so many stars. So picking out the right ones as the guided stars is tricky at first. Um, Maddie and Virginia, from Virginia, I hope to be a nuclear scientist one day, but then work my way up to being an astronaut. I was wondering if there will be a nuclear power usage in space, maybe someday in the future. Do you know anything on this topic? Well, you know, nuclear po power is used to propel vehicles. We don't use it internally, but it has been used and um, it's, it's awesome. It's, People worry about nuclear power, right? But if, if you use nuclear power wisely and safely, it is incredible. So really important. Um, and I'm glad that you're studying that because having uh, people, you know, people studying nuclear energy, that's 
challenging and rewarding. And I just really encourage you to be continue on and keep going after. I love it. And so, yes, it's really important. And I think it will continue to be even more important. And so I'm not a nuclear scientist, but you can do some great research, um, of course, through your educators and also on the Internet. So keep doing that. Oh, hello, Anna Helm. <laughs> hello, thank you. I'm really, thanks for sharing um, that you're, you're joining with uh, the Mac folks too. I wrote, that's great, I love it. And they want to know, let's see, they wanna know my favorite, what my favorite food in space was. Well, at the time, my daughter was three, so I was eating a lot of macaroni and cheese. And you have to think about how, is food in space and a lot of it is rehydrated or um kind of it kind of tastes like the canned food or as you saw some of it is actually canned so my some of my favorite foods were ones that are easily rehydrated and should taste good well mac and cheese is a good example and so it was one of my favorites plus i was eating a lot of that with my daughter at that time but also oatmeal uh these things that can be rehydrated now there's some really good foods too that our food labs make and I enjoyed the strawberries that you rehydrate. Um, they really had some good cauliflower with some cheese and also a spinach with a cream sauce. I enjoyed those a lot. And then it was fun to experiment and make your eggs and put it into a burrito um, or just however, you know, but that was one of the things that we enjoyed is we always fly tortillas because they don't have a lot of crumbs like bread and crackers. And so, putting some eggs into a tortilla, maybe putting a little bit of hot sauce, carefully shaking it out so that it doesn't get all over and get in your eye. That's important. And uh, those are some good, good foods. Um, Sophie from Virginia asks, how do you feel about the discovery of water on the moon? I know, wasn't that great news? So we knew that there was water, but this is important because it's on the site, on the all sides of the moon get light, but it was on um, in the more exposed and areas that we were not thinking might have as much water. So that was super exciting news. And it's great because as we get ready to send people back to the moon, it's, it's critical to have water, not only for humans, but also because water can help us make fuels. So it's, that's fantastic news. I was really glad to read that article this week. Um, the, the Euro STEM education asks, are there, let's see, let me read this. Are there cats, like cats that go to like astronauts? <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, and, and if so, how do cats handle the microgravity environment? Well, you know, uh, there are not cats that we have been flying in space. It would be very fun and creative, and I know we would all enjoy it. I know early on we we did have um, brave dogs and monkeys that went to space before uh, cosmonauts and before astronauts, but we have not had cats. Maybe it's their personality. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, uh, many other animals. So like I said, go check out what all the creatures are that have flown into space. Pretty fun. Um, as I'm looking through my Zoom here, Cooper from Oberlin, Ohio. How much air did your friends have in their tanks during the spacewalks? Oh, such a great question. I don't remember the volume. I used to look at those diagrams a lot, but it's been over, over uh 10 years since I've flown in space. I haven't looked at a diagram and remember it right away, but it is enough for those eight hour spacewalks. And so the, it's important also to realize that that's um, one of the things that the astronauts are paying attention to and that I ask about as the crew member that's inside talking with them um, is, you know, we're checking how um, their oxygen levels, they have a little digital print out on the front of their suits on the top of the controller that they can look down and scan through. And it's it's neat to think that in the future, maybe people won't have to be looking down. There might even be a little display that would be in front of them that could tell them how their status is doing, um, like a heads up display in airplanes. Um, so 
that is how we know how they're doing. Um, of course, oxygen is something we watch, but the biggest thing is that CO2. The CO2 cartridge has a limited amount of time, and so we're constantly making sure that the CO2 is being scrubbed out. Um, and then water is important and electricity. They actually need the electricity for the suit too. So those are all kind of things that we're watching for while they're working outside. Uh, oh, apparently I get to learn too that there were cats that have flown in space. So I didn't even know that, but apparently there was. Good, someone looked it up, it's awesome. I was not taught about that, so. Um, Mirna asks if having aviation experience is helpful in being an astronaut. Yes, it is helpful. And um, it's one of the things if people are able to get a pilot's license while they're um, you know, growing up, that's a great accomplishment. And it puts you into that position of having, having like I said, that ability to break down risk and understand what's critical at the moment. Um, you know, if, if if you have an engine on fire, you don't really care about uh, if your clock stops working or something, right? So it's being able to know what's really truly important and how to solve it at that moment and what you need to do. And aviation is a great way to learn about um, and, and actually do um, the things that get you ready to be an astronaut. So yes, if you had a chance to get your pilot's license, that would be incredible. And, she, and Myrna would also like to know if there are any specific challenges women face in spaceflight or training. I think the biggest challenge for any minority is that we are underrepresented and then often um, we ourselves discount ourselves from applying. The great thing about the recent classes that have been hired is that they're pretty much 50-50 females, males, and also we're seeing a lot more diversity in um, in our hirings. And so the more that we see people that look like us, the more that those of us that want to be astronauts can envision ourselves doing it. So it was really important for me to see Sally Ride and Catherine Sullivan because I could then imagine as a little girl, me being that. And I didn't even know about Valentina Tereshkova and she had flown 20 years earlier. Um, so it's really important. And also important is that we make sure that we, the adults, are telling the stories of all the people that have gotten us to space and not just cherry picking stories. So as we saw with hidden figures and as we'll continue to see about the stories of people that have made spaceflight possible, it takes all of us. And people have been participating for quite a long time. These stories need to be told. So let's be the adults that share these stories and make sure that we're digging up the history. It's really critical for all of us. Uh, what subjects would be helpful to enroll in for college? Well, to be, so, so now I'm excited that we're seeing that there can be people going to become an astronaut through the traditional route, which is through governments, but also there's the tourist route. But the subjects, if you're going the traditional route, it's a, you have to have a background in STEM. So find one that you love, one of the science, technology, engineering, math, and, and pursue it because you have to have that background. And now you even have to have a master's to be hired um, for, for those that are going to the lunar surface. So go find something that you're passionate about because the thing is, like we talked about earlier, not everyone that applies is going to be selected. And I, I say that to encourage you, keep applying because we want you to be selected. And people have applied as many times as 15, like my crewmate Clay, but we, um, we, we need you to have that passion and we need you to have that background in STEM. And this will be my last question. Would you want to go on a trip to Mars? And absolutely, I'd love to go to Mars. The thing is, I actually have retired, so I won't be going unless I'm flying on some commercial space vehicle. And I'm not rich, so it's probably unlikely. But I always thought it, as a geologist, it would be incredible to go to Mars, to see the largest mountain in the solar system and the deepest canyon and to understand everything there in between. And so um, as I leave you this evening, I just want to say for the kids to the kids at heart, um, always be curious. Remember, you have to work hard.
be passionate about what you do and enjoy this experience on our own spaceship, Spaceship Earth. Take care.